Amen. And uh, before we begin uh, and move on in our service, I want to, like we normally do on Tuesday nights, go before the Lord in prayer. Amen. Let's remember the canons. Uh, Elder and brother, sister Cannon called me tonight. They're not feeling well. They're kind of under the weather tonight uh, with allergies and just being very sick. Um, let's continue to remember Jesse Fuller. Amen. Having some some complications and and uh, praying that God will touch her body, heal her, or allow her to be able to go to Vanderbilt and have the specialist look at her and work on her. Amen. Also continuing to pray for uh, Huey Logan, Sheila Logan. Amen. There's several people that are out of town traveling. I'd like us to remember Sister Puckett, uh, Judy Puckett, as she travels back and forth to Kentucky to see her family. Praying that God will give her traveling mercies. Amen. Also, Brother Johnson has a procedure in the morning. Praying that God will touch him. It is a light procedure, but it's still a procedure. We're praying that God uh, would touch his body. Also, Sister Chavis is not feeling well. Uh, got sick, sick earlier this afternoon and not not feeling great tonight. She is making a sacrifice to be sitting on that piano right now. Amen. And I respect her and love her for that. But I'm praying that God will touch her body. Just heal her in Jesus' name. And church, uh, tonight I want us to take some time out. And uh, we, 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 we really need to touch heaven tonight uh, for Sister Teresa Brown. Um, uh, many of you know that after the surgery on Sunday, uh, they closed her back up. We're not able to proceed because of the complications inside of her body. After the surgery was over, she began to have some uh, complications and uh, wound up having to put in a tube. And since then, um, they are saying that uh, there's not much more they can do, pretty much giving the family no hope. And uh, this afternoon, uh, they have made the decision that in the morning, they are taking her off of that ventilator. And so... I'm just praying that when they take her off, the doctors think that it won't take long, that she will pass on from this world. Her body's not able to keep up. And that's what the doctors are saying. That's what they're preparing her them for. They say that she can go on on this ventilator like this for weeks uh, with not being responsive. Uh, so they have made the decision to remove that. I'm just praying in the name of Jesus that when they remove it, that God works a miracle in her body she begins to breathe on her own. Her body comes back. Everything happens like it's supposed to happen in Jesus' name. Amen. Sister Latanya has strong faith. She has unwavering faith. She believes with all of her heart that God is going to do a miracle for her mother. Amen. I want us to pray, church. I want us to touch heaven tonight. I want us to take a little bit longer than we normally take at prayer time on Tuesday night. Amen. More than just a 30-second prayer. But I really want, want you to touch heaven. I want you to pray as if this was your mother. I want you to have faith for Latanya, she lost her father a year ago, and now she is standing at the door of losing her mother. Uh, the whole family is, is uh, just don't know what to do right now. Um, this is very unexpected. They know she's sick, but they did not expect this to happen. Uh, and I'm just praying that God will work a miracle for his glory. I'm praying that there will be a miracle. We can come and have a testimony at this church. But I'm also praying for God's will to be done. Amen. God knows best. Amen. I'm, I told the family uh, yesterday, let's have faith until there's no more room to have faith. So we're going to believe because faith does two things. Faith prepares the way for miracles to happen, but faith also removes the space for regret. We don't want to regret and say we didn't pray hard enough. We don't want to regret and say we didn't believe enough. So we're going to have faith that God will prepare the way for a miracle. But if she passes on from this world, we're all going to be able to stand held with our hand held high and say, we prayed the prayer of faith. And if she was taken from us, then it was God's will that it happened. And she's in a much better place. Amen. So, church, I want you to lift your voice all over this room. Let's have faith together right now. Would you lift your voice? Let's pray in the name of Jesus. God, we come before you tonight knowing that you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or even think, God. We know that you are a miracle working God. God, you said in your word, by your stripes, we are healed. You said in your word that you are God and you are he that healeth us. You said in your word, God, that whatever we ask in your name, believing that we could have it. God, you said in your word that whatever we bring before you with thanksgiving and supplication, that we could have it. 
And God, we thank you in advance for the miracle that you're going to work in Teresa Brown's body. God, we pray tonight, God, for an exceeding miracle, God. God, the doctors have given up. The doctors have no faith, God, but we have faith tonight. We stand in the gap for Latanya. We stand in the gap for Teresa Brown. God, we hold hands tonight. We bind together as a church. We believe in the name of Jesus tonight. We rebuke sickness and cancer and disease. I pray that life would come into her body. I pray that virtue, God, would flow from Calvary. I pray that virtue would flow from Calvary and would flow into Teresa Brown's body tonight. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ uh, over her body tonight in the name of Jesus. I, I pray that sickness would be removed. I pray that disease would be removed. I pray cancer would be removed, God, in the name of Jesus. Every tumor would dry up uh, and die inside of her body right now. I speak to the blood in the name of Jesus. I, I speak to the immune system in her body in the name of Jesus. I pray for healing right now, God. I pray that you would make every crooked place straight. Uh, I pray you would re remove it in the name of Jesus. Uh, God, I speak in faith. I speak in favor. I stand on your word tonight, God. I speak with authority and power. Uh, I invoke the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, I invoke the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, I invoke the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, I pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of your name, by the power of your word, by the power of Calvary, by the power of your resurrection, by the power of the cross, I speak it in the name of Jesus. Satan, you are defeated. Teresa Brown will live and not die. She will live and not die. We have faith right now, God. We have faith right now. Oh, God, see our faith. Meet our faith tonight, God. Meet us at the point of our need. You said if we had faith, the grain of a mustard seed, that mountains would be moved. If we could have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, that we could say to this mountain, be cast into the sea. And God, we have faith. We have faith tonight. So we speak to cancer. And we say, be cast into outer darkness. In Jesus' name. Be cast into outer darkness uh, in Jesus' name. And now, God, we praise you for it. Uh, we rejoice for it, God. We thank you uh, that you have healed her body. Uh, we thank you that she will live and not die. We praise you now, God. Uh, we lift our voice of thanksgiving. Uh, we lift our hands and we rejoice. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, God, your will be done. Uh, your will be done tonight. Uh, in Jesus' name, would you just give him high praise right now? Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. I know you've been standing for a little while, but if you would just remain standing, I ask the ushers to come and serve us tonight. Ushers, come and serve us. Little Briar, where's Briar at? She asked me if she could say the prayer. Come on up here, young lady. Amen. Amen. Come on up here. You're going to say the prayer for us tonight. Amen. If you have your offering, please hold it up. Amen. We're going to. Uh, take up our tithe and offering tonight. Amen. Are you ready to say the prayer? Amen. Say it for us. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given back to me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither. I bring my tithe to Andrew's storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing there is not enough room to receive it. Receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, states and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, royalties received. My whole family is saved and walking with God. Perfect help means just walking to find favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, I am blessed going out. All that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. If you believe it, just shout amen. Amen. Would you bring your tithe and offering at this time? Amen. As you give and as you're returning back to your seats, you may be seated in Jesus' name. I'm going to go over a couple of announcements. I want my father to begin to get ready. In just a moment, he's going to come and bless us with a song. I don't think my mother told him. <laughs> uh, so what a blessing to have Bishop in the house tonight and my mother. Didn't that she do a great job on Sunday? 
Amen. They're going to get ready. Amen. While they're getting ready, I want to run over just a couple of announcements for you. Amen. Uh, this weekend on, the, on Saturday is the golf tournament um, at 11. If you're playing in that golf tournament, we'd ask you to be there between 930 and 10. Please be there between 930 and 10. And then this Sunday is Hello, My Name is Sunday. Amen. It's going to be a great time. Hello, My Name is Sunday. It's going to be a great time here. And um, I believe on the, on the screen behind me, I have down that the MIT class is going to be on the 24th, but that is a, that is a typo. The MIT class is going to be this coming Sunday on the 17th. Uh, and I don't think you can fix that, Gary. You can just delete that. That's fine. That's just a typo on there. Seen that earlier. Uh, so this coming Sunday will be MIT class beginning at 430. And then, of course, the 24th is going to be Pentecost Sunday. I want you to get out. And I want you to invite some people to Pentecost Sunday. Amen. We're going to have a Pentecostal experience here at Truth Chapel. Amen. On the 24th of this month, it's going to be a great time. And then Sunday Night Live, the 31st of this month, May 31st. We're going to have a regular service in the daytime. But then that Sunday night at 630, we're going to come back and have Sunday Night Live. Amen. You, you want to be here for that event. We have two special speakers. Uh, I can't tell you who they are, but you are not going to want to miss this. It's going to be very special. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be exciting. Amen. Everybody said amen. Amen. Bishop Chavis, come. Amen. Bless us with a song tonight in Jesus. Put your hands together for Bishop. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm just glad you're here. Amen. Y'all don't mind if we practice on you tonight, do you? Brand new song. And it's, uh, it's a fun song. I was talking with Elder Billy. Well, he was in here before service tonight. He was asking where we were going when we left here. I said, well, we're going home, but then we're flying to Tucson. He said, oh, I've been to Tucson. I went out there and got a prisoner. Uh, uh, a while back, and uh, and uh, you know he's talking about Tombstone and Cochise County and all those places out there. It's a great place to be, but it reminds me, uh, you know, the olden days when you got in trouble, you ran. Uh, you know, the old saying was that you couldn't run from the long arm of the law. And uh, here's Billy; he's out there to pick up a prisoner all the way from Georgia. So you can't outrun the long arm of the law. Amen. But how many know that you can try to outrun the long arm of love? And God is always there. You can't go too far with him. And he'll find out where you are. Amen? So uh, you worship with us, and uh, hopefully we'll get it right. All right? In the bad lands, a heart on the run, haunted and guilty for the things that you've done. You were wanted by justice, dead or alive. Then you're cleared of the charges by the blood of Christ. You can outrun the long arm of love. Mercy rides on. When justice gives up, wherever you are, you can't go far enough. Whatever you've done, you can't outrun the long arm of love. I mean, no, you can't outrun the long arm of love. 
longing for justice, thirsty and dry, life ruined and wasted, it was sentenced to die, oh it's useless to keep up this madness. Raise your hands and surrender to amazing grace. You can outrun the long arm of love. God's mercy rides on when just gives up wherever you are you can't go far enough whatever you've done you can outrun the long arm of love wherever you Whatever you've done, you can't outrun. Oh, the long arm of love. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Anybody got a testimony in the room? Amen. You can't outrun the long arm of love. Amen. Truer words have never been spoken. I know there's probably a lot of us in the room that can stand up tonight and testify that we tried to run from God, but he found us. Amen. He came looking for us. You can't outrun the love of Christ. Amen. Amen. Before our classes are dismissed tonight, I'm just notified that tonight, is going to be uh, one of Levi and Lily's last services with us. They're going to move back in with their dad. Uh, I don't know if that's, I just, I was just, I just heard that. So uh, I want them to come forward. I want to pray for them. Levi and Lily, are, are they in the house tonight? Come, come, come up here. Hey Amen. I love these kids so much. They got beautiful spirits and, and uh, I, I know we're going to miss, I know we'll probably see y'all from time to time. Y'all be visiting whatever, but I want to stretch your hands towards Levi and Lily tonight. We're going to pray over them, pray protection over their life, and amen, pray that wherever they go, they find favor, amen, pray that God's hand will be upon them and favor will be upon them tonight, amen. Church, would you stretch your hands towards Levi and Lily, let's pray over them tonight in the name of Jesus. God, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray for these beautiful children, God. I pray for protection over their life, God. I pray you go with them, God. I pray you give them favor, God. I pray you keep your hand upon them, God. Protect their bodies, God. Protect their minds. Protect their spirits, God. I pray that angels will be cast down to battle, oh God. I pray they will find favor, God, wherever they go. I pray in the name of Jesus, God, you will keep their spirits, God. I pray in the name of Jesus, I rebuke every enemy that would come against them. I rebuke every spirit that will stand in their way, God. I pray that ministry and anointing would flow from them, God. I speak in the name of Jesus, God. Give them gifts and talents and abilities to help build your kingdom and tear down the enemy's kingdom. I speak it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's give them a big hand. Please greet them tonight. Tell them you love them. I'm sure we will see them around from time to time, but amen. Let's keep them in our prayers. Amen. And our classes can be dismissed at this time. Amen. For those of you that are remaining, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn with me to the book of Jude. Amen. A couple Tuesday nights ago, probably three Tuesday nights ago. It's been a while since I spoke on a Tuesday night. We had a special speaker. Then we, I was out of town. Then last week we had the Wilbanks. How many enjoyed the Wilbanks last Tuesday night? They were fantastic. Amen. I'm looking forward to having them back at some, some point in time, maybe for a bigger concert series. It would be great. Amen. 
Amen. The book of Jude, chapter 1. Amen. If you have it, just say amen. Amen. I want to turn your attention very quickly to chapter 5. Uh, I'm sorry, not chapter 5, verse 5. There ain't no chapter 5. There ain't but one chapter in the book. Amen. Verse 5. Amen. Jude chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward, destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto judgment of the great day. Amen. I'll read some more tonight, but we'll stop right there for right now. Amen. Would you lift your voice? Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time together tonight. I pray that you would use this word. God, teach us, mature us, and grow us. And we will be careful, Lord, to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. Let us not only be hearers, but doers also. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to switch over here. <clears throat> Amen. A few weeks ago, we, we started in the book of Jude. Hey, Amen. It was a, let me turn some of these mics off. Uh, it was a very important book and uh, in the Bible. I wanted to uh, speak to you a little bit about it again, just because it's been a couple of weeks <clears throat> before I, since I talked about it. Hey, Amen. But Jude is written at the very uh, latter part of the New Testament. And Jude is written uh, 70 to 80 years after the death of, of Jesus Christ. And Jude has seen uh, a lot of stuff, uh, maybe, uh, so to speak, a lot of water under the bridge, so to speak, uh, in the life of Jude. He, he has witnessed lots and lots of things happening uh, in, 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 in his life. He's watched from the time of Jesus dying, uh, the day of Pentecost happened, and now he is on the very latter end of where the New Testament leaves us. He's on the very latter end of that, and he is recognizing that things have changed. Lots and lots of things have changed. Uh, there is a spirit that has moved into the church, and Jude is uh, sent as a prophet of God to warn the churches about it. I really feel like Jude, uh, along with the book of John, which is probably the next book I'm going to get into so if you want to do some, some, pre, some preemptive reading uh, for Tuesday night, you can start reading the book of John. I believe that John and Jude were written to the churches not only then, but the churches currently. That this is an ongoing word uh, that the churches need to be aware of. This is an ongoing word that Christians need to uh, take into consideration. It is an ongoing word that never falters or fails to every generation that would come after John and Jude. To every generation that would come after them, this word would be pertinent. This word would be important. And this word would fit into uh, the everyday life of the people that he spoke it to. He says things like, I gave diligence to write to you that you should contend earnestly, amen, for the, the gospel or the word, the doctrine. He says, I want you to earnestly contend for the faith the word, the faith, the doctrine that was once delivered unto the saints. And then he says, this is why I want you, this is why I want you to be aware of it because there are men that have crept in unaware who were before of old ordained unto this condemnation, but they're ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness or excess. We talked about that uh, a few Tuesday nights ago and denying the only Lord, God, and our Lord, Jesus Christ. So he's basically giving the church a warning that there are men among us that are changing the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Now, this is a very fine line to, to, to think about and a very gray area. Uh, to think about when you're when you are uh, faced with this warning, because then it, it puts you in a place where you literally have to judge every word 
that comes across to you. And I, I, I feel like judge is, is a, a strong word. Let me say a word uh, that we need to learn in this generation. That word is discern. Amen. We need the gift of discernment. Uh, I don't feel like judging people is, is a good thing. The Bible tells us very explicitly not to judge. Do not judge or you will be judged with the same judgment. So I, I, I don't believe in judging. I believe the word of God has already judged most folks anyway. We don't need to judge folks because the word has already judged you. And at the end of time, you will be judged by the word anyway. However, I do believe that we need to learn how to discern. Amen. Everybody out there talking ain't right. Well, glory. Just because they got on a suit and tie, just because they look the part, just because they sound the part, just because they got a good preaching voice, they, they look good, they sound good, that doesn't mean what they're saying is legitimate. Amen. They may have a big church, nice car, they may have a lot of good things to say, they may have a lot of followers on Twitter, a lot of followers on YouTube, they may have an audience, so to speak, but that doesn't mean what they're saying is correct. There are men, the Bible tells there are men that have crept in unaware that have turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. They have uh, changed, or the Bible says denied, the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So these, these men, some will say, well, who are these men? Well, that's the gray area. How do you discern who is legitimately trying to do good and who is legitimately trying to lead people astray. Now, 2 Peter, uh, there's a part in that, in that book where, where he says this. He says, judge the spirit. He said, he said, test it. He said, every spirit that saith that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that spirit is of God. And every spirit that says that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, that spirit is the spirit of the Antichrist. So that leaves us with, with, with another gray area because there are people that are saying that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that Jesus Christ is our Savior, but they're not giving people the full doctrinal standpoints of salvation. Amen. Easy believism. Patty cake church. Whatever you want to call it. How, however you want to put it into uh, perspective. But then there are some spirits that we know this is antichrist. Antichrist. Amen. There are religions in this world that do not believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh they do not believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. They do not believe that he is our Savior. Those spirits are the Antichrist. They are Antichrist. Amen. That is the spirit of the Antichrist. Somebody said, well, who's the Antichrist? Well, I don't know who the Antichrist is, but the spirit of the Antichrist already lives in the world. I don't know his name. I don't know where he's at. I don't know what color he is or how tall he is what nationality he is, but I do know that the spirit of the Antichrist already lives in the world because there are people who do not believe that Christ has come and they are persecuting those that do believe Christ has come. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. So somebody said, well, you know, we gotta, you know I, don't, I don't feel like God is coming back yet because the, you know, the, the, the Antichrist hadn't come yet. Well, the Antichrist has come already. It, it's here. It, it's among us. The spirit of the Antichrist. The, the man who will be deemed the Antichrist maybe not have stood up yet and said, I am he. Of course, he won't declare that he is the Antichrist. He will just be the Antichrist. He won't have a big sign on his chest that says, I am the Antichrist. He will just be the Antichrist. But the spirit of the Antichrist will live in him, but it's already alive in the world today. We, we have to judge or discern is the word I want to use tonight. We have to discern what is right, what is legitimate. How do you discern, how do I discern what is right? What's coming from, 
a, a, a preacher or a man of God or a prophet or wh whoever it may be that's speaking to me, how can I know if they are right or wrong? It, it's very important because we live in a time right now that you can go on Facebook and you can hear hundreds of people preaching. You can go on YouTube. There's preachers preaching all the time. There's people speaking on the word of God. They're saying this is going to happen. That's going to happen. You got people posting videos of rabbis saying this and this and this. You got people posting videos of preachers saying this and prophets saying this and this. How do I know all the stuff they're saying is legitimate? The only way you can know if all of this stuff is right is if you already know the word of God. And, and see, that's the problem with Christianity today um, as a whole. I'm not talking about apostolics or Pentecostals or Baptists and Methodists. I'm talking about Christianity as a whole. Our issue is, is that we don't have a firm grasp personally, individually, of the word of God. So we just believe everything we hear because it sounds good or it fits my criteria or it makes me feel good about myself. So if it makes me feel good about myself, I like it. Preach, preacher. If it don't make me feel good, if it steps on my toes, if it brings conviction in my life, oh, he, he, I, he's wrong. I don't, I don't know about that. That's, that's legalism. No, it's Bible. It's, it's, it's just much Bible as the good stuff you was hearing. The problem with the Christianity and the Christian movement is, is we are not indoctrinated. The Muslims indoctrinate their children. From a small child, they are read the word, they are read the Quran every day. They have to quote it. I mean, I'm not talking about school. I'm talking about in the home. They quote the Quran. They recite the Quran. Every day, they are indoctrinated. And we let our kids be raised by iPads and iPhones. And our kids can't even say Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. They can, they, they can tell you the whole stats of the, of the Cleveland Cavaliers, but they can't quote five scriptures. And then we wonder why Christianity is losing a grip in our world. It's, it, we're, we're blaming it on everybody else but ourselves. It's, it, oh, it's, it's this, it's this uh, political group, and oh, it's politics, and so-and-so, and him and her. Well, it happened back in the 60s. Back in the 60s, there was a big, no, no, no. It's because the church forgot to read the word. They kept listening to preachers and hearing people speaking and then it felt good and sounded good. But we forgot to indoctrinate ourselves. So when people get up and start talking everything that sounds sweet and innocent, we just accept it. But sometimes it's wrong. And the only reason we don't know it's wrong is because we haven't done what Jude said. Contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. If I don't know the truth about something, it can't set me free. The truth set you free. If, if the truth, if the truth is a key that will set you free, then a lie is a lock that will put you in bondage. And we got so many so-called Christians that are locked in bondage, not because of a devil, but because of my people perish for their lack of knowledge. We need to learn the word, study the word, read the word. How many, I'm, I know I may sound like a broken record to people that have been coming to Truth Chapel for a while. I'm always preaching about the word, but I understand something. If that, if this church, in this church, if the only person in this church knows the word, reads the word, studies the word is me, we in trouble. We are in a mess. That is not a healthy church. That is not a healthy Christian. I don't want to go to a hospital. And have a guy walk in the room all geared up with scalpels and knives and everything. And to come to find out, the only thing he did was watch a TV show about doctor. He'd been watching House. He'd been watching House for six months and he watched every episode and now he knows how to know. I don't know. Did you read the book, man? Did you go to school? Did you show me your degree? Show me your, because if you're going to cut on me, I need to know that you've been studying something somewhere. If you're going to come in the room and break out a scalpel and cut me open, I need to know that, that, that you've put the time in and you've studied and you've learned. For some of them uh, commercials of the guy who comes in the room and starts uh, doing something so professional and they say, oh, man, are you a car mechanic? He say, no, but I stayed in the Holiday Inn Express last night. 
That don't work in the church. Oh, oh, are you a man of God? Uh, no, but I do go to the church on the corner. Can you lay hands on me and pray the prayer of faith? No, but I am a Christian. The Bible says that those that believe shall cast out devils. The Bible says that those that believe shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The Bible says those that believe shall speak with new tongues. Is what it said in, in the book of Mark, chapter 16. That's what the Bible said. But if you don't know what the Bible said, how can you defend what the Bible said? How can you put on the helmet of salvation? How can you cover what you don't need to hear? How can you defend the lies that the men that have crept in unawares that were once called to this condemnation? See, that's the, the, the Trojan horse. That, that's, the, that's the deepest, darkest part of the enemy is that the men that he's talking about used to be with us. I'm not saying this church or this denomination. I'm just saying that the men that have crept in unawares used to be called to this. They used to be part of us, and now they have willingly and intentionally left pieces out. I don't know why, maybe, maybe to get a bigger crowd. You know, if you preach conviction and you preach truth, you might not have a big church. But if you preach every Sunday about prosperity, I mean, you might have a big church. Because, I mean, more people want to know about prosperity than they want to know about there's a real hell and, it's, it, and, and the lake of fire. Hell will be cast into the lake of fire. And it's going to be hot and eternal damnation. See, that's what Jude's saying. Jude says... In my reading tonight, when I started, I started in verse 5 because I'm coming to this point. Jude makes this point. He says, don't you remember? He said, you, you, you know this. He said it in verse 5. He said, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people. Somebody, he, somebody say he saved them. No, you got to say that like, say, say he saved them. He, he, he already saved. They were saved. Saved from Egypt. Saved from sin. Saved from my, He said, don't you remember that the Lord, after he saved those people, afterward, he destroyed them because they didn't believe. This is New Testament. Now, I'm not in Old Testament, okay? Jude is not an Old Testament Bible. We're not talking about Old Testament God. Now, we're talking about New Testament God. Grace, mercy, all sufficient. This is the God we're talking about now. But Jude is reminding the church, hey, don't forget who God is. Don't, don't, don't get so far out there, all willy-nilly, that God is just so awesome and so great and so gracious and so merciful. That we forget the basic fundamentals of who God is. Remember? That's why the Bible tells us way back in the book of Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Don't forget who God is. Let's not forget here that who God is. Remember that when he saved them afterwards, they couldn't believe. He, he destroyed them. He said, but let me break it down. Let me go back farther. Let me go farther back than Moses and the children. I'm going to go way back. I'm going to go to heaven. Even the angels who could not keep their original estate. He cast them in the outer darkness, bound by chains. Angels that did not have free will. Angels that could not think for themselves. Angels that he created, angelic beings, because they could not keep their original estate, because they couldn't keep it straight. He cast them in the outer darkness. He saved the children of Israel, and after he saved them, they couldn't get right. He destroyed them. Jude's yelling from the mountaintops, let's don't forget who God is. He's yelling to the churches, let's remember who God is. We got we to gotta remember that faith that was once delivered to the saints. We can't get so far out here that we forget the basic genetic DNA of God. I've said this so many times, I'm going to say it again. God is not American. I know we like to wave our flag, and we all mad because folks doing the flag thing and stepping on the flag and stomping on the flag, and we so American, we want to go kill somebody. You know, I dare you to burn a flag in front of me. We so American, but God is not American. 
we say in God bless America, but the only way God blesses America is if America blesses God. Because God wasn't born in Chicago. He wasn't born in Arkansas. He ain't a good old boy. He's a Jew. He ain't from here. He, he, he doesn't even understand our culture. The world that Jesus Christ lived in is so far removed from this world. We try to put, our, we try to put God into this culture. But God is not of this culture. He is not a political position. You can't vote him in. You can't vote him out. God is an anarchy. This is how God thinks. It is my way or you go to hell. I mean, that is straightforward. And listen, people don't want to tell you that about God because it, it makes God sound uninviting. But Jude is saying, church, let's don't forget who God is here. Let's don't forget the basic fundamentals about God. He wants it his way. He Don't forget what he told the children of Israel back in the book of Numbers. He said, you tell them I'm a jealous God. L let's don't forget that. Let's don't forget that when Moses came down the mountain and they were all naked worshiping the golden calf, that he made them crush it up and drink the bitter water and then had the Levites kill their neighbor and their friend and 3,000 men died. Let's don't forget that God. Let's don't forget that when they decided not to go in, let's don't forget that when they let 10 men, just 10 men, convince millions to not go in, that God let everybody over the age of 20 die on a 40-year death mark. Let's don't forget that God. I'm so afraid for our church, not, not for America, not for society. I'm afraid for the church. Culture is going to do what culture is going to do. Sin is always going to be sin. People are always going to have drama. We're trying to change America. America don't need to change. The church needs to change. If the church would change, we could change America. We all praying God change America. I'm praying God change the church. We, can, we can't forget who God is. We can't forget who God is. We have forgotten who he is. We have made him strawberry shortcake and genie in the bottle. And he's going to give us everything we want. He's going to be so nice and so kind. But ladies and gentlemen, there is a judgment day coming. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, only the very elect shall be saved. Now, are you living that lifestyle? Are you living the very elect lifestyle? Could you stand and just... Shout from the rooftop. I'm, I'm elect. I'm, 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 I'm living it by the, by the line. I'm the pastor and I can't. I can't forget who God is. Jews putting us in remembrance. He's, he's calling to the church tonight. He's putting us in remembrance. In verse number seven, he says, even... As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. He said, let's don't forget the Hebrews. Let's don't forget the angels. And Lord, don't let us forget Sodom and Gomorrah who just gave themselves over to ungodly, uh, un, unruly, just, just defiling themselves amongst themselves. Let's don't forget what God did there either. Why, why is Jude in the New Testament, the, te the, the testament of grace, the testament of mercy, the testament of God washing away sins? and re why, why is Jude at the end of this New Testament warning the churches? Because Jude has seen it. Jude is witnessing it. It's almost as if Jude was beamed into this society in 2015 and stood in, in this society, read our newspapers, watched our newscast, and said, I'm going to go write a book about this. 
It's almost like he is standing with us and he's reminding us. I want, you to, I want to put you in remembrance of this. Even Sodom and Gomorrah stands as an example. He said, likewise, in verse number eight, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise or despise dominion or despise authority, they, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contended with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But they that know naturally are brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, gone in the way of Cain. What way did Cain go? Cain went in the way of killing his own brothers. He said, woe unto them because they've gone in the way of Cain. They kill each other. Let me just do some types and shadows here. They, they kill their brothers. They backbite. They gossip. They talk physically, spiritually, mentally. They kill their brothers. And they ran greedily after the error of Balaam, or Balaam was the, Baal was the god of Jezebel, Jezebel, the god of materialism, the god of grandeur and splendor, the god of all about me. I call Baal the god of the selfie. Well, some of y'all get that later. And he said, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Now, Korah was the one who wanted to be the preacher. Korah was the one who despised everybody that was in authority because he thought he should be in authority. I'm not listening to y'all because y'all need to listen to me. He said, these people have gone the way of killing their own brothers. They've gone in the way of materialism, and they've gone in the way of despising authority and setting themselves up above the set government of God. But if you remember Cain, he was marked with a mark and was a vagabond for his entire life. If you remember Baal, the prophets of Baal were destroyed by Elijah when God answered him by fire. And if you remember Korah, God made the earth open up and swallowed him and all his sons whole. I don't, I don't want to be none of those guys. These are spots in your feast of charity, in verse 12, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds are they without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit were, wherewith, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. He said, these are spots in your feast. They feed themselves, and they're not even afraid. They look like clouds that carry rain, but there's no rain in them. They look like trees, but they ain't got no fruit on them. They're twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which, have, which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit, now, he's given us a down, uh, uh, he's given us a little glossary here of who he's talking about and who they are and how we should 
receive them or not receive them. But then in verse 20, which is what I'm getting to, and I'm, I'm going to close with this. In verse 20, he says, but ye. You see, at this point right here is where you need to break out your pen and your notepad. Because he's talked about the sinners. We know the sinners. It's easy to see the sinners. All you got to do is drive down the street, go into Walmart, turn on the TV, pick up a newspaper, a magazine. We see it every day. We know what's going on. We know what they're doing. We know they're mockers, they're scorners, unbelievers, filthy, sensual, the Bible called them. However, what are we supposed to do? Jude says, but you. Uh, see, he's talking to the church now. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. What should the church be doing? Church should be praying. The church should be praying. The church should be standing on their faith. The church should be praying in the Holy Ghost. Woo. The church is so worried about them, we forgot what we're supposed to do. We, we're so enamored with what they're doing, we forgot what we're supposed to do. We, we've neglected our duty. The church has to be praying. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Verse 21, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I, this verse 21 here, I believe what he's telling us to do here is look for mercy. Is he telling us to keep a positive outlook? We look on the world, we look at all the sin, we look at all the debauchery, it's easy to become cynical. Come on, Christians in the room. It's easy to become cynical and say these people are going to hell in a handbasket. Forget about them. That's not what God wants us to do, though, church. It's easy to become cynical and cut them off and say there ain't no hope for the world and God just come quickly, oh Lord Jesus, and save me and let everybody else just go to hell in the handbasket. But that's not what God says. He said, I want you to look for mercy. He said, because where sin did abound, what, 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 grace. You see, the church is keeping their eye on all of the negative but what we need to be doing is keeping our eye on the opportunity for mercy. I see sin, but I also see an opportunity to save somebody. I see struggle and strife. I see debauchery, but I also see that there's mercy here. God can do something with these folks. God can bring these people out. Hey, listen, where would you be if somebody didn't look at you and say, look, look what God could do with him. Look what God could do with her. Where would you be if somebody didn't take a chance on you and tell you that Jesus Christ loved you? Where would you be tonight? I feel the Holy Ghost here right now. The church is so enamored with politics and we on Facebook running around trying to prove somebody wrong on our political view when that's not what the church is supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be praying and looking for mercy. I'm not trying to prove nobody wrong. I'm trying to prove God right. He can save anybody, anywhere. There's an old song, some of y'all probably don't know, but it used to say, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. I don't know, y'all know nothing about that. You have to go all the way back to the mighty cloud of joys and then blind boys of Alabama. That's what the church needs to be doing. Yes. Trying to tell somebody that God can save anybody. We, we, we've forgotten our position, church. We, we, we've forgotten who we are. We're trying to be politically powerful. When God never asked us to be politically powerful, he wanted us to be, to be prayerfully powerful. Who cares if we're not in politics? We're in prayer. Prayer changes politics. Prayer changes things. Prayer turns things around. Prayer puts a covering over. Prayer gives you the strength to make it through it. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Watch what he says. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Woo. Compassion. 
You know what the church needs to do? We need to open up our compassion again. Turn off condemnation and open up compassion again. Listen, I know they're in sin. I know it's bad, but where's the compassion at? I know it's ugly out there. It's, it's easy to see it. You can just open it up and you see it, but where is the compassion from the hearts of the ones who call themselves Christians? When Christ saw the sinner, he said, I'm coming to your house. When Christ saw the sinner, he said, go and sin no more. When Christ saw the sinner, he said, take my hand, rise up and walk. When Christ saw the sinner, he said, I can fix you. When, now, when the church sees the sinner, what are we doing? What are we saying? How are we doing it? It's easy to condemn. It's hard to have compassion. He said, of some have compassion. He didn't say all. He said some. We can't reach them all, but we can reach some. We can't, we can't save everybody, but we can save one or two. We can't reach everybody in Loganville. But let's say we can reach 1,000 of them, 2,000. We can at least let them all know that we're here and we love them and we're praying for them. Have you ever got a problem? Truth Chapel's the place to come. We can have compassion. Watch what he says in verse 23. And others save with fear. Here we go. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now he said, pull them out of the fire, hate the sin, love the sinner. I hate the garment. I hate the garment spotted by flesh. I hate the sin but I'm saving the person. There's some folks got to be pulled out of the fire. I mean, we got to, listen, the Bible says this. Jesus told his disciples, he said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Okay, now I don't know if you knew this or not, but gates don't move. Gates, the gates of hell are not coming for us. Gates don't come to you. You come to gates. The gates of hell are not on, their, on a road march coming against the church. No, the church needs to be on a road march coming against the gates of hell. The gates of hell will not prevail. When the church reaches through the gates to pull folks out, the gates can't stop the church. Are oh, you hear what I'm saying tonight? Where's the church at again? Where are we at? Where's the Christ? Where's the compassion? Who are we reaching out of the fire? Who are we pulling out of the fire? Or are we standing back roasting marshmallows, talking about everybody who's dying in the fire? Or are we reaching? I know it's Tuesday night, and I, I don't want to preach it here tonight, but I feel the Holy Ghost. The church needs to stand up one more time and say, let's pray, let's fast. Let's reach for mercy. Let's look at with the grace of God. Let's reach into the fire. I know they're not living right. They don't have it all right. They don't know it all. But there was a time when I didn't have it all right, and I didn't know it all either. I still don't have it right. And I still thank God for the mercy of God that would reach down and save a wretch like me. I don't know of one story, one testimony where somebody said I was in a ditch with a needle in my arm and Jesus Christ, robed in the flesh, came down and picked me up and took me to church. I can't find one testimony like that, but I can find thousands that say somebody from the church came by, took me, fed me, put me in a home, got me out of the cold, brought me to a church and said, hey, there's a man here by the name of Jesus Christ. They brought me to him. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Woo. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Here we go. I don't know, Brother Chavis, if we want to bring all that sin in the church. I just don't know if we just need, we just, you know, all them sinners. In the church, I don't know if the church can handle that. I came in church, I didn't know who was the sinners and who was the saved. Well, if you went to a church and nobody in there was saved, then you was in the wrong place. That's not a church, that's a convent. It's different. He said, unto him who's able to keep you from falling. Falling where? Where am I falling to? He said, if you're going to the gates of hell and you're getting the people, and you're dragging them out, and you're having compassion. He said, don't worry. 
I have enough power to keep you from falling in. You just go get them. God's got the church. Don't worry about church. Well, there's more of them than there are of us. It's never been about us and them. You are them. Such were some of you. But by the grace of God. The church has got to wake up and come out of this mentality that we're the saved. and they're, No, we all lost until the trumpet sounds. Everybody's lost until God says it's over and brings us in. He said unto him that's able to keep you from falling, it's going to be okay. You're not going to fall with him. Go get him. You're not going to fall with him. He, he can keep you from falling. Too many folks don't want to get too close to the fire because we're afraid of falling in. Huh. Say, Brother Chavis, you know me. We bring those folks in the church. You know, we, we bring them folks in the church, and I just don't know what we're going to do. Church is going to be turned over to a reprobate mind. We think God is so weak. We think God is so, God, God needs us to protect him. <laughs> we're protecting God. We just want to protect this place. We don't, want to, we don't want to get out of hand in here. We want to protect the house of God. God doesn't need you to protect him. He's good. Not to him that is able to keep you from falling. I got you. And to present you faultless. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to get, I don't want to get no sin on me. No, no, he's able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He's I'm, I'm gonna be joyful to do this. It's like the man who hired workers to work in his field. And he came home in the afternoon to greet his workers in the field and everybody was clean except one. Everybody's fingernails were still done. Hair was still right place. And clothes was okay. And there's one guy whose fingernails are dirty. And his hair is all disheveled. And his garments all tore up. and He's sweating. And got one shoe on, one shoe off and hair all crazy. And the master of the field says, well, I can see who worked today and who didn't. And I sometimes I feel that's a church. We were to walk into heaven so pretty. Oh, look at me, Lord. Without spot and blemish. And Jesus says to us, don't you realize that the only time I was able to save is when I was covered in dirt and blood and guts? I didn't come in riding on a white stallion to save the day. No, no, I died on a tree to save the day. So if you're trying to present yourself so clean and so pretty and without fault, no, 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 I'm able to do that. I will present you faultless with joy. I'm afraid the church is going to show up clean. No dirt, no blood, no working clothes. We're going to show up in the Armani. We're going to show up nice. And God's going to say, that's not what I wanted. I will make you without spot and blemish. That's my job. I will present you faultless. That's my job. Your job is to get out in the field and work. What he said in the book of Matthew to his disciples, surely the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Who will go and work? Verse 25, ending to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. In closing tonight, Jude gives a scathing beginning where he warns us to be careful. There are men that are turning the grace of our God into lascivious. There are men that are denying the Lord. He gives us a scathing report. Then he turns our attention to the debauchery of the world, the culture that's around us, the people that are evil and, 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 and they mock and they scorn and they fornicate and they commit adultery and there's no limit to their debauchery. He reminds us of Hebrews. He reminds us of the angels that fail from heaven. He reminds us of Sodom and Gomorrah and all of that mess. And then he reminds us, but hey, but you, but ye, 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 but you. I talked about them. Let me talk about you now. Pray without ceasing. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Have compassion. Love. Look for mercy. 
It's easy to see the bad, but it's hard to see the good. Look for mercy. Go find somebody who's in the pit of hell. Drag them out of the fire. And God, him, he's able to keep you from falling. I don't want this church to be full of saved folk. It's not what I want. It's, it ain't got nothing to do with me. Either. I don't think God wants this church to be full of saved folk. I, want, I, I believe God wants this church to be full of people who are looking for something real, something legitimate, something that can change their life. Who cares if we have a, a, a pretty stage? And Who cares if we have good music and nice lights and a nice building? People want to know, can, can I be changed here? It's, it's something real here. Listen, if we're trying to keep up with the pretty church, we, we've already been outdone. There's a lot of churches in this city right here that are beautiful, have great facilities. They have gyms and they have uh, kitchens and they got beautiful stages and they have thousands of dollars of lights and projectors and TV screens. And they, One day, one day we'll have all that. But right now, we ain't got all that. But I don't believe that's what folks are looking for. Folks are looking for a place that can come and they can legitimately find him and be changed. They want to know, how do I come off alcohol? How, how can I come off drugs? How can I get my babies back home with me? How, how can I find rest for my weary soul? How, how can I come off all these medications? How, who, I heard that your guys pray and people were healed of cancer. I, I, I heard that you can pray and people are healed. I'm looking for something real. Not a social club, but something real. That's what we need. We're not going to get that. I'm trying to focus on all of the debauchery around us. We got to have compassion. We got to do what the church was meant to do. Pray. Believe. Work. And wait. Pray, believe, work, and wait. Pray God will do it. Believe God will do it. Work until we see God do it and wait for his return. I hope when he finds me, he finds me in the field working. I hope when he finds me, he finds me dirty, covered in blood, covered in, in dirt, covered in other folks' sin that I've dragged on the fire. I hope he looks at me and says, you've been working. I hope he don't find me in Armani looking my best. Time to be the perfect Christian. Look at me, Lord. Look how great I am. He said, your righteousness is as filthy rags. It don't even, it don't even mean nothing to me. What, what you can, what your, your righteousness? Don't even present that to me. It's like dirty rags in my hands. I share my glory with nobody. So there's no reason to try to get glory here. There's no reason to say, look what we did. The song doesn't say, look what the church has done. The song says, look what the Lord has done. <laughs> look what the Lord did. And I hope that when the people look at my life, they can say that, look what God did. And not say, well, look what court did. Because what I do will not last, but what God will do will last forever. Stand with me all over the room. I wanted to tell you all this story. Talking to my mom and dad. My dad's about to be 60, and I can't tell you my mom's age because I'm afraid of her. But my mom and dad, they, they in their old age, they got a, they got a big church, big, beautiful church. Uh, but in their old age, I say old age, and they're going to get mad I said that. But in their later years, they went and started another church. Well, my dad has a lot of family in this, in this area, Wadesboro. Is that a church in Wadesboro? We started a church in Wadesboro. I mean, they could have just kicked back, relaxed. I, I know he's got offers from UPCI to come to headquarters and get an apartment, get one of those desk job type deal, fly all across America, fly all over the world. He was just in the United Nations building a few weeks ago, one of the very first church services ever in the United Nations. My father was there, able to be at that and speak at that event. I mean, great things are happening all over the world, and, and my father's a part of all that, and so he could easily kick back when he goes to Wadesboro, North Carolina, where there ain't nothing, and starts a church. Because he's got family members that live in Wadesboro that need God. I got a cousin there. Her name is Mama Cat. I don't know her in real name. 
You got to know my dad's family. I don't know her real name. I don't think nobody knows her real name. Her name is Mama Cat. We call her Mama Cat. I'm afraid of Mama Cat. And she got a sister named Moosey. They, wow, I think Moosey's still in jail. Oh, she got out? Good. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Mama Cat uh, lives with a woman. She's been in a relationship with a woman for many years now. And, and, and we've all known that Mama Cat is a lesbian. But my mom and dad are there winning Mama Cat. Mama Cat's been coming to church. Got baptized? She ain't got baptized yet? Her daughter got baptized and they come to church. They're feeling the spirit. Things have been happening. She come to my mom the other day. She said, hey, what's her, what's her girlfriend's name or wife's name? Ramona said, me and Marona, we got, we got separate rooms. Now, you, you may say, well, but, but Jay, what, what's, that, what's important to that? What's important is, is that you love the sinner. You, you hate the sin, but, but, but you reach for the sinner. You hate the garment spotted by the flesh. But you still got to reach for folk. Now, most folks would have just wrote her off, said, oh, no, she in that, in that lifestyle and that's debauchery and the, and the devil is a lie. I ain't getting near that. But let me tell you. There's a good chance, a good chance that Mama Cat's going to be walking the streets of gold one day. And it'll be because somebody didn't say, well, that's just sin. I ain't messing with that. Now, who do you know in your life that nobody else would touch with a 10-foot pole? But maybe they walk streets of gold someday because you said, you know what? Forget what culture says. Forget what the church says. Forget what church society and church culture say. I want to love somebody, have compassion on somebody, and reach somebody for the name of Jesus Christ. I say there'll be a stone in your crown for it. It's worth it. Amen. Let's pray tonight. God, I love you. I thank you for your word. God, the book of Jude convicts my spirit, God. It makes me open my eyes and pay attention to the religious world around me. Make sure I'm not falling prey to false doctrine. And God, it also reminds me, God, that your spirit will not always strive with man. It reminds me of who you are with the Hebrews, who you are with the angels, who you were in Sodom and Gomorrah. I haven't forgotten who you are, God. My problem is, God, I've forgotten who the church should be. Our problem today is not who the sinner is, God. We recognize them. Our problem today is not who God is. The problem today is who is the church. God, the church, we got to stand up again, God. I pray you give us strength at Truth Chapel to stand up again. I pray you give us strength at this church to fall on our knees one more time. Oh, God, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, you will hear from heaven and you will heal their land. God, let us remember that. We have to pray again. We have to have compassion again. We have to put down societal, cultural ideas, and we got to reach for the harvest field one more time, God, in this last and evil day. God, help us to not be cynical, but help us to believe when nobody else believes. Help us to reach when nobody else will reach, and we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Stretch your hands towards me in dismissal tonight. I pray that when you leave from this house that God would cause his face to shine down upon you. I pray he'd give you favor with God and man. I pray he'd prosper you and protect you this week. I pray that he would give you strength to reach up, reach out, reach down, and reach in. I speak it with power authority over your life and your family's life. In Jesus' name, amen.